Today on Stronger Than Reason, we get cylindrical with Pig Face's first album, Gub. Welcome to Stronger Than Reason. So, let's talk about the ship of Theseus. <laughs> Alright, so maybe that's not what you were expecting, but that's okay. Trust me, it's relevant. So, the ship of Theseus is a philosophical concept that's pretty useful in everyday life because you can find examples of it everywhere. And it leads to some pretty interesting questions about the nature of identity. So I'm going to demonstrate the concept with this robot I made out of Lego blocks. And don't laugh because this is how my friends and I made Lego robots back in the day. So this little guy is an OG. And you can tell he's shaped a little bit like R2-D2 but not so closely that it's going to put me at risk of getting sued by Disney. But anyway, I happen to have another headpiece here. And what I'm going to do is swap his head out for this other piece, which is pretty much identical to the original. And I can do this because Legos of the same shape and color are fungible. That is, they're completely interchangeable without unique attributes that would let you distinguish one from another. So fungibility is a concept from economics, and you can think of it this way. If something is fungible, it's not collectible, because one of these things is as good or as desirable as any other. And these little two-by-two two slant orange pieces are fungible, since they're more or less completely identical and indistinguishable from others of their kind. Um, you know, as an aside, you're probably familiar with the term fungible from the recent craze in NFTs, or non-fungible tokens. And there's really nothing mysterious about those. An NFT is nothing more than a block of data, kind of like a file that's made unique and distinguishable through cryptographic techniques, specifically through something called a blockchain, though that really isn't important. What is important is that it is a piece of data that's intentionally made non-fungible. And each NFT therefore has certain properties like a public record of ownership that no other NFT could have, and those particular properties could make one NFT more or less desirable than another. Anyway, NFTs are a little beyond the scope of this episode, although they could be their own episode if I ever want to branch out into covering really stupid internet crazes. But getting back to this little guy, the question we want to ask is, after I swap the heads, is this robot still the same robot? I mean, it looks the same, and, you know, it feels the same, but to you and I, we both know that I changed something. I changed the head around, and okay, that's fine. We might compromise in this point by saying it's the same robot, but with a different head. But you know what? It just so happens that I happen to have a spare body over here, too. So let me swap the body out here, if I can do that. There we go. Now, is it the same robot? I mean, it still looks the same and feels the same, but you and I both know that every bit of this robot has been swapped out. Every bit of it is now different than when we started. In fact, I can now recreate the original robot by sticking the old head on the old body. And obviously, I can continue swapping these pieces back and forth in any combination until the concept of identity becomes, you know, exactly as blurry as we want to make it. So the ship of Theseus is based on a legend from ancient Greece. Tradition says that Theseus went to Athens, killed the Minotaur, loaded all the children onto his ship, and sailed them to safety. Supposedly, the people of Athens would commemorate this voyage year after year by maintaining the old ship as pieces wore out and fell apart. So the question became, after hundreds of years of maintenance and after every part of the ship was replaced at least once, can we say it's still the same ship? And it's interesting to consider because there really is no clear answer. And it leads to some pretty deep considerations of what it means for something to be the same. For example, on one hand, you can pretty clearly say it's not the same because it's theoretically possible to find and assemble all the original pieces of the ship as waterlogged and rotten as they might be and reconstruct the original boat. So in that case, for sure, you'd have at least two full ships worth of parts so the boats would not be the same. On the other hand, you could consider the original boat to be a four-dimensional object, that is, 
a three-dimensional boat that is morphing and changing over time, but it's still the same by virtue of the continuity between its maintenance. So there's never a point where you're reconstructing the whole boat at once. So in that sense, it's pretty clearly the same boat. And I'm sure you could come up with your own arguments either way. In fact, this might not seem like a problem to you at all because, like many things in life, it's sometimes easy to quickly see one solution or another right away and you just glom onto that. But it does get pretty fuzzy when you think about it some more. So the ship of Theseus problem crops up all the time. Sports teams are a great example. So as Jerry Seinfeld once pointed out, you know, players come and go from teams all the time. And after a few years, everyone on the team has been replaced. So as a fan, what are you really rooting for? <laughs> well, you're rooting for clothes. <laughs> That's what sports fandom really comes down to. You're rooting for a uniform, not people. Uh, another example that comes up a lot is my grandfather's axe. So it goes like this. You know, my grandfather gave me his axe. And even though I replaced the head twice and the handle once, it's still the same old axe, right? Or what about the human body? Because science tells us that the elements that constitute our bodies get replaced every six to ten years. So you aren't even the you you were a decade ago. All the stuff that made you up during the Obama administration, all that hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, calcium, and phosphorus, it's still out there in the world right now. It's just no longer a part of you. So much like the old ship of Theseus, it's theoretically possible to reconstruct the old you out of all that junk. So are you feeling less special yet? <laughs> or how about the USS Constitution? It's the oldest commissioned warship still afloat, currently docked at the Charleston Navy Yard in Boston. But that ship has undergone three major restorations in its over 200-year history. They replaced nearly every part of that ship at least once, making it a literal ship of Theseus. But the most relevant example for our purposes here today is, you guessed it, bands. So let's talk about this phenomenon of band members joining and leaving bands. And when that happens, is it still the same band? And I'd argue that often it's not the same, despite the name not changing, because music is such a personal means of expression, and it brings different personnel into the mix who will inevitably change it in ways that are either subtle or obvious. And this is true no matter whether you're talking about band members, producers, or other folks on the creative team, because they're all ingredients in the stew that is the finished product. And it's kind of beautiful when you think about it, because bands are fluid things. Even if the members don't change, people change over time. You change, and I change. So no matter what, bands evolve and change over time. They're dynamic. So pick any band at all, and you can point to differences in their output over time. And I think that's something to celebrate. It's not something to get mad about when you listen to a band's record and you get upset that it doesn't sound exactly like their last record. Change is generally a good thing in art and in life. But what if some band took this idea of member swapping to an absurd extreme made it a principle of the band itself, in effect, setting up a band of Theseus. And maybe in time, the band would be composed of entirely different people, but in some sense still be the same. Well, lucky for us, someone did try this, and I'm sure it's not the first time this happened in the world of music, but it's the first time that I was aware of it happening as a fan. So here's how it went down. In 1991, I was a budding industrial fan, as you may know, and ministry were the kings, and throughout 1990, they had been touring their most recent album, The Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste, and as I mentioned in episode 51, my friends and I were somewhat obsessed with the live album and video, in case you didn't feel like showing up, that captured that tour. As I mentioned repeatedly, ministry at this time was kind of the center of the industrial rock universe. Al and Paul were juggling a half dozen side projects, and other up-and-coming bands were aping ministry sound in hopes of stealing some of their market share. Even some older bands were getting in on the action. For instance, in August of 1990, Killing Joke released Extremities, Dirt, and Various Repressed Emotions. And this album 
was pretty obviously influenced by Ministry's live sound and in fact featured drums by one of Ministry's touring drummers, Martin Atkins, who, as we'll see, will factor heavily into today's story. So somewhere around Christmas 1990, I remember catching wind of a new project coming in the wake of the Mind Tour. And I can't remember now how this came to me because I wasn't on the internet yet, so it must have been through word of mouth. Someone might have been reading about it in a zine or something. All I knew was that the new project was going to be called Pig Face, and it was going to be an industrial supergroup, and Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails was reportedly involved. So you know that I was immediately on board. Whatever they had in mind, I was there for it. And as it turned out, I happened to go to the big city that spring to a proper mall that sold some music that wasn't strictly top 40. And, you know, I commenced scanning all their cassettes because at the time I still only listened to cassettes. And, you know, in thinking back to that day, I just remembered how stores would display cassettes in those silly plastic frames. Like, do you remember those? So... A cassette tape was, what, like three by five inches, and these plastic frames would kind of extend them out to make the whole thing about a foot long. I guess that was to make them harder to steal, I suppose. But you would take this whole big thing, this clunky thing, up to the front desk, and the clerk would unlock it with a key and throw the plastic into a big pile of them just just to reuse later. And it's funny because I don't remember stores doing that for CDs because... New CDs were almost always just in shrink wrap with the anti-theft beeper on them. So you'd almost always have to walk out of the store through those scanner things. And used CD stores had a completely different approach where they'd only put the empty cases on the shelf and you had to take the case up front. And if you were lucky, the bored and out of it clerk might actually put the correct CD in your case before they sold it to you. But anyway, it's kind of funny what comes to mind looking back on how purchasing music used to work but I did have a turntable back in these days but as I've said a million times I was not interested in vinyl I viewed vinyl at the time as being a 70s relic and I think that's pretty true of anyone in the 90s who wasn't a DJ I mean none of my friends were DJs and none of them collected vinyl really after middle school after all the great advantage of a cassette was that you could pop it in a Walkman and carry it around with you So anyway, I was scanning the cassettes, and lo and behold, I got to the P section, and I saw this, Gub, the new album by Pigface. And I yanked it out, and there was a funny sticker on it. And I'll pull that sticker out now, because after all these years, I actually kept it. So here it is. I don't know that you'll be able to read this. Almost certainly won't be able to read this, but... What it's doing here is it's listing everyone involved with the project and their better-known bands. So I'm going to read this to you. It says at the top, warning, this is a prostitution sticker. And then it has Martin Atkins of PIL and Killing Joke, William Rieflin of Ministry and Revolting Cox, Paul Barker of Ministry and Revolting Cox, Chris Connolly of Revolting Cox and The Beatles, N. Esch from KMFDM, and I like how they put periods in between all the letters of KMFDM. Uh, Ogre of Skinny Puppy, Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails, David Yao of Jesus Lizard and Scratch Acid, and Matt Schultz of Lab Report. And at the bottom it says, buy this product. Now, about four or five of these people were on the Ministry Mind Tour, which was a clue to what was really going on here. Uh, But I really wouldn't catch on to what was going on for a few decades, and more on that later. Regardless, that sticker should have been a huge red warning flag, and years later I would recognize it as classic Martin Atkins name dropping. And it's not that he's being dishonest. I mean, he straight up tells you that it's a prostitution sticker. Uh, It's just the fact that this sticker that listed those names and those bands is in fact what sold so many copies of this record. Because as it turned out, it would hardly matter what music Pigface created. All that mattered was that the band existed with those names involved. And whatever it was they were selling, the names would get kids to buy it. I mean, I was only 18, so I hadn't really heard the term caveat emptor yet. And this would turn out to be maybe the first musical purchase where I got the distinct feeling that I'd been had. (laughs) But... I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, Looking at the sticker, 
it was interesting that some names weren't on it, namely Al Jorgensen, who at the time was the godfather of industrial. I mean, why would Paul be involved but not Al? And I'm intentionally telling you this story in this order with my personal experience before any background because I didn't have any background at the time. Remember, this was pre-internet. I only knew what my friends knew, and our only inputs were MTV, which barely talked about industrial, and the music magazines like Alternative Press and maybe Spin. But now that I had this tape, I had a little more info uh, of all of my friends. I think I might have been the first or maybe even perhaps the only one to actually buy this album. I'm not sure. but And you can bet, though, that I greedily took it home. I checked it out. And first I studied the sleeve. Uh, you know, the artwork struck me as being kind of low effort. <laughs> it's just black and white clip art, although it's, it's very artfully arranged. Um, it turns out the CD and LP formats would show much more of this artwork than this cassette did, which was usually the case. I mean, the same was true with uh, Too Dark Park, for instance. But this particular cover was designed by Bill Rieflin's wife, Francesca Sunston, who you may know contributed the cover to KMFDM's Nihil. And of course, she was a very talented artist, so that is kind of neat. Um, the liner notes gave a little bit more info. And uh, let's see here. So also present here was William Tucker, who was a uh, roadie and touring guitarist for Ministry. And uh, that's it. So yeah, you could see that it was also produced by Steve Albini. Uh, more on him in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, the next couple of panels in here just talked about who played what on each track. You know, the gist of this being that some small subset of this group was active on any given song. So it wasn't like all these people were playing on all the songs. In general, the pattern was that Martin and Bill would share dual drum duties, just as they had on the Mind Tour with various other members chipping in. Great, I thought. So I put on the tape. But before I get to that, what did I expect? Um, let's talk about expectations. I guess I expected... A ministry or Revco-like blast of industrial, you know, something with a lot of energy, maybe some rock, some dance, some experimentalism, something catchy that would push this industrial genre into exciting new places. And it turns out that Pigface, as a band and as a project, would indeed push the genre into new places, but not musically, <laughs> at least not not so much on this album. Uh, so I played back the tape. I sat back. I prepared to get blown away, just like the guy in the chair in the famous Maxell ad. And, you know, the first track featured Ogre. It was called Tapeworm. And I thought, great. What came out of my speakers was Ogre, all right. He was just essentially ranting over a two-bar rock pattern on a drum kit and a bass guitar with a whole lot of noise thrown over the top. I mean, this song had no changes. There were no parts. It just kind of went on like that for four minutes and just ended in a blurb of noises. And that was it. I mean, I can't say it in any other way than I found it kind of disappointing. I mean, was this even a song? So it had rhythm, check, melody, mm, not really. Texture, yeah, if you count white noise. Energy, Eh, not so much. So maybe it was technically a song, but wow, even as a naive 18-year-old, it struck me as a pretty low-effort affair. Like they taped Martin jamming with Paul and asked Ogre to improv over it, and then Martin just added a lot of annoying sound effects, and boom, done. Put those names on the cover and sell it to the kids. So at this point, I might have been feeling maybe a bit ill, maybe a bit lied to, I mean, compared to this track, Ministry was Montavani and Skinny Puppy was Stockhausen. And as we would say today, there just wasn't much there there. And also, if this track was the opener, what did that say for the rest of the album? So, okay, fine. I braced myself and I pushed ahead to the second track, which is called The Bushmaster. And this one, I was told, featured Martin and Bill with David Yao on vocals. And I didn't know who David Yao was. 
but I was vaguely aware that the Jesus Lizard were a rock group of some kind. Remember, this was early days, 1991. The Jesus Lizard had only released two albums to this point, Head and Goat, and I owned neither. So I had no clue what to expect. So this groaning noise starts, and then drums, lots and lots of drums. Okay, that sounded pretty good. At least there was some energy here with Martin and Bill in full animal mode. And that must be Mr. Yao providing his crazed, drunken vocal stylings throughout. In fact, they double-tracked him, so it sounded like multiple crazed, drunken Mr. Yao's. And maybe the drums were crazed and drunken, too. I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, So the Bushmaster isn't exactly something you would dance to, but you could probably mosh to it, at least. But was it a song? Was there an arrangement? And if by arrangement you mean that the drums occasionally started and stopped, then yes, yes, there was an arrangement. And I wouldn't go so far as to say it's like verse, chorus, verse, but it's a little more varied than tapeworm, at least. Still, the instrumentation is pretty sparse. This is really just a drum jam with vocals. Uh, Trent's credited with loops here, but Lord knows what they were. I can't really hear them. Maybe they just tried to stick his name on as many of these tracks as possible. Anyway, for those keeping score, I kind of dug this track, The Bushmaster. Uh, Anyway, I dug it more than the first one. So at this point, I was feeling uh, cautiously optimistic, and I rather foolishly proceeded to the next track, which was called Cylinder Head World. Now, this was an experimental piece, (laughs) evidently, that incorporated a very strange instrument called the anti-tank guitar, or the ATG, as invented by the aforementioned Matt Schultz of Lab Report, but here played by Martin and Bill. So, if you're not familiar with the ATG, as I was in 1991, so imagine a wooden 4x4 beam that's maybe 6 feet long, and you put a bunch of pickups on this thing and add some piano strings to it. I mean, why not? Voila! you have an ATG. And they seem to have made this track by beating, scraping, and otherwise folding, spindling, and mutilating the ATG strings. So is it innovative? Surely. Is it some interesting sound design? Surely. Is it something I want to listen to? Eh, maybe once. Is it a song in any sense? No. Is it filler for this album? Yes, but as it turns out, it's not the most egregious filler. That'll come later in a little bit, so stand by. So at this point, teenage me is feeling pretty lousy again. Like, (laughs) what is this crap? Where's the beat? Where's the bass? You know, I can't blast cylinder head world out of my car speakers while cruising the strip. You know, so like, what use is it to me? So feeling a bit annoyed now, I go on to the next track, which is called Point Blank. This one is credited to Atkins, Rieflin, and Connolly. And that's cool. I like me some Chris Connolly. Most of the time, I can understand what he's saying. Plus, unlike some of these guys, he can actually carry a tune. So, I start listening. More drums. But wait, is that a bass? Is that a guitar? All of a sudden, this sounds like it could be a real song, a rock song. And Chris is singing. That's all right. But who is that on guitar? Steve Albini? Who's that? You know, in 1991, I had no idea who Steve Albini was. I wasn't familiar with him at all. And the guy's a real character, and I can say that with affection as a fellow paisano. Of course, I'm well aware of who he is now. Uh, For those who never heard of the guy, he was in seminal punk bands like Big Black and Rape Man and Shellac. And of course, he's made a name for himself as a producer or as an engineer, as he prefers to be known, with many famous bands like Pixies, The Breeders, Jimmy Page, and Robert Plant, and many, many more. Uh, Steve's a guy who's very, very knowledgeable about the technical aspects of recording, and is something of an insufferable analog purist. I'm sure he's friends with Jack White. But anyway, go read Steve's essay, The Problem with Music. I think it was from 1993, but it'll give you a very good idea of where he's coming from. Uh, To say he's opinionated is an understatement, but he does back up his opinions by being intelligent and informed, especially within the realm of the music industry. And anyway, he'd arguably peak 
1993 when Nirvana sought him out to record their third album, In Utero. And you can read all about that fiasco online because I'm not touching it. So yeah, Martin Atkins sought out Albini to record this album, which is pretty interesting since Albini was a rock purist who famously hated electronic music and Al Jurgensen in particular. And here he was with I don't know, six-ninths of Al's band. Lucky for him, Al wasn't a part of Pigface. But more on that later. Now, getting back to Point Break, uh, I mean, Point Blank, this might be the first actual song on the album. And it's not a great song. But at this point, I was happy to just hear guitar, bass, and drums and vocals all in one track. This was the most complete-sounding thing I'd heard so far. So, like the band, such as it was might have actually written this and then practiced it more than once. So at this point in my listening, I had perked up again. Great, I thought. Two out of four ain't bad. Let's move on to track five. Ah, this was called Suck, and it was fronted by Trent himself. And despite my best efforts, my expectations were starting to rise unreasonably. Surely, Trent wouldn't let me down. Well, we have some pretty cool-sounding phase drums that come in, and then he starts singing. And hey, pretty good vocals. Cool lyrics. Of course, this song, Suck, would go on to have many more lives. This early version would be something like a demo, because there's hardly anything to it. It's just some drums, some intermittent bass, and vocals. And this reminds me of something. In the software world, we have this term, MVP. And it doesn't mean most valuable player. It means minimum viable product. In other words, when you're writing a piece of software, how simple can you make it that it technically still meets its goals? And that is the minimum viable product. And in methodologies like Agile, a team will typically target MVP for the first release and then iterate on that to make gradual improvements, kind of filling it out. It's the old idea of delivering value as early as possible in the process and then expanding from there. So another analogy we use in the software world is the cake analogy. So people like to eat slices of cake, right? So if you're building a cake and it takes a long time to build, maybe you want to build it one slice at a time. So you don't build it one layer and then the next layer and then the final layer so that the entire cake gets done at once because that takes too long. You want to deliver vertical slices instead because that gets them out the door quicker. And again, this is a metaphor for software. Please don't try to actually make a cake this way. You're going to be terribly disappointed. Nearly as disappointed as I was after shelling out $12 on Gub. Anyway, the cake slice is the minimum viable product. And in my mind, this Gub version of Suck was the minimum viable product for this song. In coming years, this tune would evolve a lot in Pigface's live show, into something pretty different and, in fact, pretty cool. Uh, And, of course, Trent would famously remake it as one of his two hidden tracks on his Broken EP, which I talked all about in episode 31. It's kind of fun to compare the Nine Inch Nails version to the original, since it's his fully realized version according to his own vision of the song. So give the two a good listen, because there's quite a stylistic jump there. But yeah... As far as me listening to this album for the first time, this track really delivered. It was kind of thin, but it was clearly a song, and it was clearly a good song, as proven by the fact that it grew into so much more over time. And it's maybe Pigface's best-known song even to this day. So at this point in my listening, I was feeling redeemed for my purchase, because Suck was pretty cool, whatever else might be on this record. And little did I know that the next track was something called Symphony for Taps, which is another wonderful bit of filler. Uh, I mean, edgy experimentalism. Uh, This time it's literally two minutes of Martin messing around with a sink tap in his hotel room at the Howard Johnson's. Uh, Evidently there was something wrong with his water pressure, and it caused the flow to pulse strangely as plumbing occasionally will do. And, you know, he saw it as you might, as a golden opportunity to capture this phenomenon and foist it on the world as another offering on the debut album by industrial giants Pigface. So thank you, Martin. I'd like my $12 back. Also, I want to point out that all the YouTube instances of this song have comments turned off. Gee, I wonder why. 
Anyway, the less time we spend on this track, the better. So now, feeling a bit used, Teenage Me ejects the tape, flips it over, and taking a deep breath, embarks on side two, the first track of which is called The Greenhouse. And right away, I'm suspicious because in the liner notes, I see Martin credited with playing a Doritos bag. And I'm thinking, (laughs) what kind of baloney is this going to be? Well, folks, it's essentially a three-minute drum circle, so everyone grab a djembe, uh, but an actual backbeat does kick in after a minute, and then some really crazy oscillators, which is Albini again, and yes, Martin is there on the side, tearing apart a Doritos bag in the right channel. I gotta say, this song is boring and forgettable, but someone who is enterprising could probably sample the drum parts and make a half-decent song out of it, because the drums are actually okay. But at this point, Teenage Me, pretty mad. Even Suck may not be worth this garbage. So on to track eight, Little Sisters. Pretty cool dual drum track, okay. Chris Connolly's vocals, okay. More drums, second verse. And then, ooh, some pretty sweet guitar riffing from William Tucker. And all right, all right, I can dig it. And what is that? A little key change? Can it be? And so at two minutes in, this little song is about as heavy as it gets, which really isn't very heavy. But I have to say, like Suck, there are the bones of a cool song here. If only they had done a tiny bit of homework to put some meat on it. So fortunately, though, like Suck, this song too would get a workover and become a pretty fearsome track indeed, far beyond this little album demo. And that's what really a lot of these tracks are. They're demos. Their minimum viable products foisted off on us punters as actual songs. Shame! But we'll talk more about Little Sisters later, trust me. So for now, 18-year-old me is plugging gamely through side two. Next up is a track called Taylor Made. And the first thing you hear is a snippet of one of the drummers practicing on a pad while chatting with someone. And then it turns into a pretty cool drum and bass workout, you know, in the sense of two drummers and one bass guitarist, but I'm okay. I'm good with that. There's some silly sound effects. There's a fake ending where everything slows down. And then on the mic, Mr. Paul Barker, ladies and gentlemen, who manages to sound more convincingly menacing than all the previous vocalists combined. But still, the whole way through, it's just bass, drums, and vocals. Why did they not add a guitar part? You have like four awesome guitarists on this project. (laughs) Why not use one of them? Probably because they're all propped up in the corner out of their minds on six different drugs, I guess. I don't know. Uh, This tune, Taylor Made, it does have a bit of energy, I'll admit, but like most of the songs here, it feels unfinished and not super impressive. Uh, Honestly, it sounds like a song your garage band could jam out to for an hour when you didn't know what else to play. So, There is some dumb DJ scratching at the end, but there's just not much of a musical idea here. The best thing about it is the vocals, so props to Paul. I always like Paul's vocals. Go out and check out the latest two Lead Into Gold albums if you haven't already. Uh, So final judgment, not terrible, just meh. So let's move on to everyone's favorite. Vorek nicht immer in guter Jung. And there's more to that title, but it's, you know, ostentatiously long, and it's all in German, and I can't pronounce it all. And I'm not going to play the game, folks, by trying to recite the whole thing. Uh, If you want to hear it spoken by a native speaker, just listen to the song, the first few lines as recited by N. Esch of KMFDM. But be warned that you will have to sit through a minute or so of some pretty horribly piercing synth drones courtesy of the normally placid Bill Rieflin. Uh, Seriously, this synth line that he's playing could probably repel mosquitoes, and it definitely repelled me. More often than not, I would just note past this entire song, and I probably did it on that first listen, too, if I'm being honest. You know, just mash that fast-forward button, folks. Nothing to see here. Uh, It's pretty much just another noise track, like Tapeworm, just with N.S. screaming instead of Ogre. And as much as I love N. Esch, I, and I say this as someone who enjoys his first solo record and his stuff with Slick Idiot, this song is pretty terrible. Just two thumbs down. Sorry, N. So on to the last two tracks, both of which are 
Chris Connolly numbers. The first is Blood and Sand, and there's not much going on here, folks. There's some simple tribal drumming, occasional banging on the ATG, and Chris singing through some really annoying vocal effects. And all I can say is, meh. And finally, finally, Weightless, which is what my wallet was feeling like at about this point in the game. And amazingly, it starts out like a real song with guitar, bass, drums, vocals. There's even something like a chorus, or at least a second part, that is unlike the first part. And there's even another fake ending. What do you know? This is actually a song. It's not terrible, and it's maybe not my cup of tea, but it is, in fact, a recognizable song. So, way to go, Pigface. You did it. You did it. Although, 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 I happened to randomly catch a clip of the band, such as it is, playing this song in 2018. Martin and Chris, of course. And none other than Danny Carey of Tool on drums alongside Martin. And I gotta say, it was pretty badass. So, you know, this is another song that did eventually grow legs. But there it was. 12 tracks, maybe three actual songs. And as a young fan, I wasn't super impressed. I mean, the talk among my friends once this record got around was about what a cop-out it was. It could have been so much better. It should have been so much better. Let's face it, it was a scam. It was a money grab. And it, it just went to show that in mid-1991, anything with a whiff of industrial would sell. And if it had Trent's name on it, so much the better. And Pigface would certainly ride his coattails well into the 90s and beyond. And that should have been it for me, really. After all, res ipso loquitur, the music speaks for itself. But naturally, I couldn't help seeing the odd pig face interview here and there. Alternative Press, naturally enough, ran a piece about the first tour, and I remember it had photos of Trent and Ogre singing, so it was kind of clickbaity in that way. And in the article, they let Martin run his mouth about how pig face was a new kind of band, one that would never have the same lineup or play the songs in the same way twice, or play songs at all, or have a lineup at all. And while they're breaking all the rules, like the one about making songs that were interesting, or that took more than 30 minutes to write and record. Uh, frankly, even as a 18 or 19 year old or whatever, my bullshit meter was going off, because ultimately, I'm a fan of music, not of musicians. So if, even if a bunch of musicians that I like, in theory, get together and put together some crap music... I'm not going to dig it, and to be honest, apart from Suck and Little Sisters, there wasn't much here for me. There might have been if they had made a bit of an effort to develop more ideas, but alas, here we are. So in terms of fandom, I didn't seek out more pig face, despite the all-star roster that, sure enough, began rotating almost right away. So Trent was among the first to go, having maybe found something better to do with his time, like record Broken and Fixed. Chris and Ogre would stick around through the subsequent tour along with Tucker, Martin, and Bill, though Bill would leave soon after. And, you know, I'd love to know Bill's thoughts on all these goings-on, but as far as I know, he never made them public. He just quietly packed up his kit one day and went home. And, you know, I always respected him for his intelligence, and that decision just reinforced that. But I noticed that they continued to put out albums, often with completely new people on them. In fact, the second album was a bunch of live versions from the first tour, which, you know, is actually pretty cheeky. Like, what, what gall? Talk about double dipping. Like, oh, you bought Gub? Great. Why not buy it live? Listen to some improvisations. Yeah, I, I didn't fall for that. But if you want to check it out, it's called Welcome to Mexico, Asshole, for some unknown reason. I guess humor, maybe. But evidently, they did grow into something like a real band over that tour. At least, they polished up some musical ideas into songs that packed more of a punch. And now, here's something that I really don't understand, because they came out with an EP a few months before Gub came out, as it turned out. It was called Spoon Breakfast, and I don't have a copy. Apparently, the original is very rare and sought after. But all the material on that EP is included with the CD version of Gub, and it had just four tracks, all remixes. It had a Little Sisters remix called Tonight's the Night, a Bushmaster remix, and remixes of Vorek Nicked and Tapeworm. Now, I find just two of these to be notable, and then I have a riddle for you. So first we have the Bushmaster remix, 
which is cleverly called the Bushmaster Bushmaster remix because it sounds like Martin just ran the original master track through a delay unit. Like, <laughs> seriously, that's the biggest ripoff remix idea since the Sisters of Mercy played an entire track backward and gave it a different name. I mean, come on, but it's actually an improvement over the original, so I'm for it. However, we need to talk about the Little Sisters remix, Tonight's the Night, because folks, this is what all of Gub should have sounded like. It is a fully realized hammer blow to your brain. It's unrelenting, it's menacing, it's awesome. And this is the only song in this whole sorry mess that in my mind truly achieves this group's full potential. As my bandmate would say, all the rest of this stuff is just hand fire. I mean, seriously, go out and Google Pig Face Tonight's the Night and give it a good listen. I think it'll impress you much more than anything on Gub proper. And what's the riddle? Obviously, if Tonight's the Night existed before Gub, why didn't they just make another seven kick-ass songs in this vein and put that out as the album instead of 12 songs of meh? I mean, was challenging Norm so important that we had to listen to two minutes of Martin playing in the sink? I don't know. I guess it was, but it seems like a fail to me. But anyway, while we're talking about related releases, I should also mention that an interview disc came out around this time, and it was called, naturally enough, Lean Juicy Pork. And of course, you can find it on YouTube, if not in real life. But I have to say, it's damn near unlistenable. There are interviews with most of the folks from Gub, but Martin chose to put screwy effects and noise over the whole thing, so you can barely hear what anyone's saying. And then he threw a couple live cuts in there, including some new stuff, a.k.a. some dodgy improvisations given proper names. So tread carefully. Now, those of you who've been with me for more than two episodes will no doubt know where I'm going to go next, because I mention it all the time. That's right. It's Chris Connolly's memoir, Concrete Bulletproof, Invisible and Fried, My Life as a Revolting Cock, now available in fine bookstores everywhere. Hopefully, Chris will give me a shout-out someday for endlessly pimping this thing, but I really do think it is an enjoyable read, and it remains the best insight we have into the world of Chicago industrial, not counting the drug diary that is Al's memoir. So, not only did Chris deal the dirt on his time in Revco, Ministry, Murder, Inc., and his solo project, but he also dishes on Pigface, and he unabashedly explains the project's origin story. Essentially, it was a way for the ministry touring band to continue partying after the mine tour. So staying out on the road, living in their little tour bus bubble, hanging out, getting high and drunk, and pretty much avoiding real life or responsibilities. So in that end, I suppose it was much like George W. Bush, mission accomplished. But as far as making memorable music, eh, not so much, except for Suck, of course. It was mostly a matter of putting a thin layer of varnish over a turd and calling it a day. Martin and Bill were the founding members, as it were, though it quickly became Martin's show since he signed the band to his new label, Invisible Records. And I guess another motivating factor here was to get out from under Al's totalitarian thumb and stop being, as Martin put it, a ministry cover band. So too bad they called it Pigface and not the No Owls Club though maybe they could have brought in Alan Wilder, because, you know, in the No Owls Club, they're allowed to have one owl. Anyway, Chris describes the start of the tour as one embarrassing show after another as dedicated fans emptied their wallets only to experience a two-hour poetry slam and drum circle with random audience members being invited to come up and try playing or singing. So it was kind of like a post-industrial open mic amateur night with Martin wearing the same white and black striped shirt every day. The man is a marketing whiz, whatever else you have to say about him. But the odd thing, though, as Chris described it, was that the shows eventually started to get better as the songs developed and as the band gelled, in spite of themselves, as the Viagra boys might say. So toward the end of the tour, they really got their act together and put on some pretty good shows. So... Why do I love Gub? Obviously, I'm not sure I do. I think I like the idea of it. I think the execution was lacking. Something tells me I'd like Latter-day Pigface much more than the first album. I honestly haven't given it a shot yet. I just haven't gotten around to listening to it, and maybe I'll check that out one of these days. 
Maybe you want to give me a recommendation. Where should I start? Where do you think was Pigface's high water mark? You know, in your opinion, please let me know in the comments and I'll check it out. Maybe I'll do a follow-up episode. For sure, though, I do like some pig face related projects like the Damage Manual, which is another super group, this time of Martin Atkins, Chris Connolly, Jaw Wobble, and Jordy Walker. And I gotta say, this project was more on point than pig face. Martin's production was pretty sweet, too. You know, I might do an episode on them someday. Though they didn't last long, they imploded pretty much right away. It turns out a band's strengths can also be its weaknesses in terms of volatile personalities, but again, that's a story for another time. So where did it go from here? Well, to be sure, Pigface grew like a big amoeba, and today boasts some 100 or 200 musicians who've graced its albums and shows, including such disparate folks as anyone who ever played in any industrial band in Chicago, Flea, Genesis P. Orridge, Black Francis, Raven, Youth, Alex Patterson, F.M. Einheit, Jello Biafra, Meg Lee Chin, Leslie Rankine, Keith Levine, Jim Marcus from D. Vorzal, Douglas McCarthy from Knights or Ebb, Cynthia Plastercaster, Beefcake the Mighty from Guar, and Penn Gillette from Penn and Teller, among many, many more. The band was never the same twice, it was always changing. In fact, you've heard of the Six Degrees of Separation game. Someone should graph out the Six Degrees of Pig Face. I'd be willing to bet a ham sandwich that everyone listening to my voice right now is within six degrees of knowing a Pigface member. You know, becoming a member of Pigface is actually on my bucket list. Maybe Martin will hear this podcast and reach out and offer me a chance to sit in with the band or something, or maybe contribute some drum loops, or, you know, just have me playing the kazoo. Because I'll do whatever it takes, just so I get to wear the official Pigface beanie and the next time I'm in Chicago or New York, I can wear it while walking around. And when I inevitably see another person wearing one, we can lock eyes and nod knowingly at each other. Or maybe give a little wave like the people who drive Mazda Miatas. You know, it's a social thing being in pig face. It's like a cool club. Anyway, you know, I can dream. But also... This is strange, but I just want to point out the glut of industrial bands that used the word pig in the early 90s. So, of course, the first was Raymond Watts, originally of KMFDM, who took pig as the name of his solo project, and who in 1991 released his second album, which was called Praise the Lard. So, I think clearly, Raymond gets the belt here, folks. And then we had Pig Face, and then, of course, in 94, Nine Inch Nails released The Downward Spiral, while Trent was living in the house where Sharon Tate was killed by the Manson family, and he very sensitively called his home studio Le Pig, which is what the police had found written in blood on the house that night. Nevertheless, track two of that album was the great song Piggy, which I'm sure all my listeners are familiar with. If not, shame on you. Go listen to it right now after you listen to Tonight's the Night. And then in 1996, Ministry who were pretty late to the game by this point, released their album Filth Pig, which oddly would have much the same effect on ministry fans as Gub did. But that's a different story. Whatever else Gub was, it was the start of a project that encompassed hundreds of people over nearly three decades. And, you know, there's something honestly to be said for that. And I looked on Setlist FM before this show, and the most recent Pig Face show was November 30th, 2019, and... Where else but Chicago? And who knows, maybe Martin will resurrect the band once he recovers from opening his industrial music museum. And maybe one day Pigface will truly become a band of Theseus. I mean, it almost is right now. Martin is the only original member, so it's kind of like having a ship that's been completely replaced except for the steering wheel. So maybe someday Martin will quit and the band will just keep on going without him. On and on sailing into the future, spanning generations. Yeah. So there you have it, folks. An actual cassette tape from my archives, Pig Face's Gub. You know, I had to brave the spiders and the radon to fetch this from the crawl space, and wow, you know, I really had to dig for it. It was really far in there, and it wasn't easy. Uh, so I hope you're happy. Anyway, you're listening to Stronger Than Reason, either on YouTube or as an Apple or Spotify podcast, the show that's not explicitly about political mayhem and subversion. But you know, there's always an undercurrent of that. 
And I'm not going to say that George Soros isn't floating some cash my way to put out some carefully encoded propaganda. But I'm not going to say that he isn't either, or that I wouldn't take it if offered. I mean, come on, George, I could use one of those cool road microphones. You know what I'm saying? As always, I thank you for listening, and until next time, stay strong.